Our guest tonight has done it all, film, television, stage, musical theater, drama, and comedy, and he excelled in all of them. Let's welcome actor Alec Baldwin. Had I known you were gonna show all those old movies of mine, I wouldn't have accepted your invitation. That was, that's <laughs> excruciating. I wanted to tell you that you don't have to look at your work because, uh, you know, everybody feels the same way about their work, by yeah. the way, when you show least favorite thing. Yeah. But I have to say that looking at all your work and doing research, uh, your work is just so varied and vast and excellent. As I was starting reading, it was like nomina nominated, nominated one, nominated one, but obviously, there was like um, a journey to get there. Can you tell us how you started in the business? I had gone and taken an acting class in uh, college when I was at George Washington University. And uh, I was taking political science and I wanted to go to law school. And the idea of spending my academic year studying acting sounded ridiculous you know so i was going to go get a real degree and get a real job and i took an acting class at gw which was like a gut class to take just to complete my semester and uh, uh we did a scene study class and then i went to visit a friend of mine then I, I didn't do that badly i mean you, you can tell right away if you have some <clears throat> a if you can take direction you know, you're there and the teacher will say, try this, try that. There's a little directorial exchange there. And if you can take direction and, and change and see and be open to how you can improve, then I think you have a, 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 a potential aptitude for that. So I went to visit a friend of mine who uh, was at NYU. She had transferred from GW to NYU and her roommate was in the drama program. And she said, oh, you should audition and you should audition and you should audition and you'd be so wonderful in the program. I think you'd be great. And I thought that was just the dumbest idea because I thought I don't want to spend all that money to go to NYU, especially to get a degree in acting. And I went in there and I auditioned and I got a scholarship. They gave me a full scholarship to come to school. I mean, you know, the tuition scholarship to come. And I went there. And so it actually cost me less money even though NYU is ex more expensive. This is critical because my family had no money. My dad and my mom were apoplectic that I was going to leave GW to go study acting. But uh, my dad got it. My dad especially said to me, you'll never be young enough to do this again. So I went to GW, to NYU. I went to Strasburg through them for a year. Uh, Jeffrey Horn was my teacher and Marsha Haufrecht was my teacher and uh, Elaine Aiken was my teacher. <clears throat> and I left school, I had one more semester to go because they wanted me to do three semesters to transfer my credits. And I went for a year and then I just got a job. I just kept getting jobs. I got a, on a soap opera. I moved to LA and did nighttime TV. And slowly over the course of like six or seven years, did a lot of TV and pilots and some theater in New York. And then uh, I got into the movie business and made movies that, you know, back then uh, a few of them were successful and made some money. And once you star in a film that makes some money, uh, things become a bit easier for you in the business, at least for that, at least for a period of time. So we have to assume you had, so, you showed some talent from the beginning. Um, I have, you are skilled both in drama and comedy. Did you just kind of start with drama and then slowly went into comedy? Was it something that was a hybrid from the beginning? You did both? Well, I think that you just, I think for me, it would just do what's in front of me. Just do what's put in front of me. I did a soap and I was on that show for almost two and a half years. And of course the material on daytime TV and there were so many more soaps back then than there are now. Um, there were quite a few and a half hour and one hour. And you know, that's its own animal. You're there and you have to try to make this material. You have to fight the urge. You have to resist the urge to comment on it and to send it up and to make fun of it. And because, uh, you know, writing a fresh script every day uh, uh, for five days a week is a terrible, is a terrible uh, uh, task for those people. I, I grew to be very, um, 
sympathetic toward the writers. And the task is to try your best to make it work. You know, and eventually I learned that I watched the other people around me who they tried to find something to play and they could uh, make it work. And then when I got into nighttime TV, you know, I think that you, you reach a point where <clears throat> everyone on the set has made more movies than you have. Everyone on the set knows more than you do. Everybody has more experience than you do. And slowly that changes. And in the beginning, you have a kind of a, a, a kind of a, boyish gratitude you're like oh i'm so i'm so happy to be here i'm so thankful that you hired me can i get you some fresh coffee you know, you're very much of a of a guest in someone else's house so to speak and then slowly that changes where the next thing you know you're on the set of a film and someone says something to you and you go no i think it's this and they go huh okay let's try that you know we're, we're, we're eventually you built up a uh, uh a um a bundle of experiences, uh, of practical experiences, where you're beginning to understand what's going to make the scene work, you know. And uh, um, I think I got to that point, you know, at, at some point I got there where I really kind of knew what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do, you know. And <clears throat> But it's a process. And for me, it was drama. You know, I did, uh, uh, I did the movie Miami Blues that was funny but very violent. I did the movie uh, Beetlejuice, which was funny, but kind of weird. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly not the thing that's funny in that movie. And, uh, and and all these little films I did, then I did the movie Hunt for Red October, which was really kind of a, you know, a military drama, if you will, and um, an action film, if you will. And, uh, but slowly, you know, right after that, like you get toward, you know, the early nineties, let's say I was making movies for about five years that I began to have be much more clear on what I thought was necessary. You know, I, I developed some, some experience. I have to say that I watched the reunion of 30 Rock on NBC the other day. And I'm not just giving you flattery, but my real opinion. I thought you were the funniest of all of them. Oh, well, I don't. Great, straight face saying those lines. And you saw somebody who's kind of master in his profession. 30 Rock is a, a, probably one of the ultimate examples of <clears throat> me being the beneficiary of very good writing. You know, if, if it's not funny on the page, it's, uh, uh, it's unlikely you can make it funny. The writing was the best I've ever seen in terms of comedy. It was very fast paced. It was very... Uh, um, uh, uh, weird and quirky and clever and topical or, or not. It, it, it had a, a, the right amount of heart into the story sometimes. And uh, I, you know, some, of, some of my favorite scenes were with Elaine Stritch that played my mother. And, um, you know, the, the whole idea is it's a character that's given to you where the character is, uh, uh, you know, one way on the outside. There's a membrane in between how he is in public and private. You know, in, in public, he tries to be very commanding and very together. And sometimes he, uh, uh, and sometimes he is genuinely uh, expert at something. I said, it's not gonna work if he's completely full of baloney and he doesn't really know anything he, and he's just a fop, it's not gonna work. He needs to be somebody who's very good at business. He's, and and the, the, the thing is, is that, <clears throat> He's a, you know, kind of widget executive who's come to the creative world. So it's a, it's a horrible match. And as I try to widgetize uh, uh, the comedy, uh, the TV comedy business, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, funny and horrible things that result from that. But I, I think that when I did the show, uh, you just had to, uh, I hate to say this, but you just had to just say the words and get out of the way. <laughs> Don't put a lot on it, you know, because it was so well written that it was really pretty effortless, I think. I mean, the only thing that was hard was to remember the words, because sometimes they gave me the really long speeches, and I had to drink like 10 cups of coffee in the morning to get myself <laughs> ready to go. You know, it was a very, very, uh, 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 it was a lot of words to memorize. I can ask you a lot of questions. Of course, I wanted to ask you about my favorite uh, question, which is about Trump, because you brought so much levity 
at a time that we all needed it. But um, maybe one of the students is going to ask about that. I really want to open it up for this student because it's really uh, their time to ask you yeah. questions. Excellent. We have a, a question here from Yulia Kort Kortkova, who looks like um, she just might have lost connection, but I will go ahead and ask her question anyway, in case she's still on. Um, what is the first thing that you look for in a script when you get it in for the first time? Well, <clears throat> I try to look at the whole piece. I try to read the movie, and the first thing I try to decide is, um, is this a movie I think is a good movie? You know, because because why would you want to be the tree falling in the woods and there's nobody there? Why do you want to give a performance that no one's going to see? Even if there's a kind of a, you know, great scenes for you and good writing for you, if the movie doesn't work. So I try to, the first thing I try to ascertain is, does the movie itself work? And then I ask myself, is it a movie that I want to make or a movie I want to see? So if you say that my character uh, is a psychopathic killer who walks onto a kindergarten bus with a flamethrower in the opening scenes of the movie, I might not want to do that movie. I might not want to be that guy. I mean, I have been offered parts where I said, well, I don't necessarily want to be that guy, somebody who's like really just a complete monster or a complete jerk or whatever. Um, I, I don't mind doing th those things if it's in the service of a good movie, you know what I mean? And then uh, the thing I asked myself is the last thing I asked myself was my character. And, I, and I've played parts in films <clears throat> where the um, uh, my character wasn't the biggest role it wasn't in the the, the, the most uh, 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 well served in terms of the page count of the of the it wasn't the lead role let's say but there was an opportunity for me in terms of that character I thought that character could have an impact on the film and be if, if it was well written it, it it made a difference there's movies I've been offered where you kind of think you can get anybody to play that part. There wasn't anything special to it. There wasn't anything I could bring that was really uh, uh, unique. So I look at the film in terms of the quality of the writing in the film and the story. I look at the film in terms of, do I want to put myself through that? You know, there's a, you do put yourself through something in some films you do. And then the third thing is, is, is my role in the film um, just superfluous? Some people will, always ask you to come do a film and do something that you did in another film. You'll come to their film and they'll say, well, that thing you did in that film, do that in my film. And you'll think, well, maybe not. You know what I mean? You, 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 movies, uh, I don't make a lot of movies anymore because of my kids. I, mean, I got remarried and my wife and I have a lot of children now. We have a lot of little kids. And so going off and shooting films is always a, a difficult proposition. But um, I always say the same corny line. I say, uh, acting is like sex. When I was young, I would do it with anybody. You know what I mean? And now I'm a lot more particular about what, what acting I do and why and with who. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Melissa Medeiros. Melissa, we've enabled you to start your microphone. What is your question for Alec? Hi, Alec. <laughs> It's, it's great to hear you talk about your career and everything because I really admire you. So thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us today. Um, my question is, I know there's a huge difference between acting in plays and in movies, but do you feel that there's also a big difference between acting in TV and in movies? Well, there can be, there can be because <clears throat> um, movies typically and this is just my interpretation movies typically they exist inside that one framework it's like a, there's a frame to the painting uh and the movie's 100 minutes long it's uh, uh you know uh, 120 minutes long whatever and the story starts and ends and your task is all inside of that construct and uh you have to really really movie making is a lot of pressure movie making is very intense if it's a drama because you want to make sure you've exposed every aspect and, and, you, and you've turned over every stone in terms of what the possibilities are and also narrowed it down to what's worthwhile and what works. You can have all kinds of crazy ideas, but they don't really work for the story. Like how do you get down to what works? TV is different because 
it, it's week after week after week. Even if you did a limited series of 12 episodes, there's more time you can spread your arc of your character over uh, and the things that they want to say, what the character's purpose is, and the storytelling can be spread out over more times. So you have to look at it with more, um, uh, I don't want to say patience, but more... <clears throat> complexity because there's things you might you might have a very quiet episode you might have an episode where you're not featured you're you're unless you are the lead in the show um you are, are part of a, a cast of people and your relevance and your significance in the story may go like this through episode after episode so some episodes will be strong for you and some episodes will not be strong for you and so you have to kind of uh uh, um, uh, you know, parse that and really, really uh, factor that in. In a movie, you got to give it everything you got. You know, you got to really focus and lock down and get those takes really the best you can because, I mean, unless it's uh, some movie which is a huge budget, you're not going to go back and shoot it again. When you're in front of that camera and they say action, that's the time for you to get it on. And you got to be ready to do it then. Uh, you don't turn to them and go, oh, I have a headache. I don't feel good. Can we do this tomorrow? It's unlikely <clears throat> that that happens anymore. And, um, uh, you know, movies are just so much more intense, the shooting of movies. And TV is a little bit more of a, of a, of a, of a stroll, you know what I mean, through the character. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Sarah Whalen. Sarah, we've enabled you to start your microphone. What is your question for Alec? Hi, um, thank you for taking the time to answer my question. Um, as an aspiring film director, what can you tell me is most crucial for a good relationship between actor and director? And how have directors made you feel comfortable to perform in the past? Um, could you say that again? Oh, I'm sorry about that. As an aspiring film director, what can you tell me is most crucial for a good relationship between actor and director? And oh, I see. How okay, got yeah. it over just in terms of getting what I want. I want us to go on this journey together and I want you to get what you want to go into the cutting room. So directors need to be in charge. They need to be very clear. This, if you can't describe the film to an actor in under three minutes, then it's a failure. You should be able to say, this is a story about a guy who goes on a whaling ship and he meets this crazy Captain Ahab and Ahab had his leg bitten off by the white, wh you know, whatever, go. This is a story about Atticus Finch. He's a lawyer in the South and this black guy, Tom Robinson, boom. You just, this is a story about Terry Malloy and he's a team, he's a, he's a longshoreman and during the corrupt days of the unions, boom. You lay it out there. If you can't do that, then I think most sensible actors don't want to work with you. You have to be able to say, this is the movie I'm making. This is it. And everyone will join you in trying to, because uh, a, a, a filmmaker sometimes doesn't accept the fact that they're like a conductor in the symphony. You want to make sure we're all playing the same piece in the same time actors tend to kind of off road and go do this and they want to do this and they want to draw attention to themselves. They want to draw attention to their performances. They're not necessarily doing the film. And the director has to make sure everybody, we're all doing the same movie. Let's all do the same movie together. And the director has to be responsible for that. I've, I've done movies where I literally walked up to the director and I said, you're going to let him do that like that? <laughs> yeah, there would be somebody doing something just uh, horrible, just abysmal. You know, I mean, thankfully it wasn't often, but there would be something that would do that. And <clears throat> you could see there were directors who, they didn't want to confront the actors. They didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to uh, uh, instruct the actors. Uh, and you have to, you have to, you have to know what your film is and stick to that mission and stick to that, that uh, uh, path. Is that, is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, very. <laughs> very. We have a question here from Athena Singh. Athena, we've enabled you to start your microphone. What is your question for Alec? Athena? All right. Well, I will go ahead and ask Athena's question. Athena asks, how do you get into character 
or what is uh, what makes you relate to a character as you're preparing? I think the first thing I think about, I've always said this many times, and some people uh, um, find this helpful, some people don't necessarily find it helpful, and that is the disposition of the character, the nature of the character is very important to me. Is the person someone who is confident in the world? Do they lack confidence? Are they someone who is strong in the world or are they weak in the world? Are they someone who is very verbally facile and the words come flowing off their tongue and they speak very eloquently? They're good speakers or they're not. They're always reaching for a word. They're fabricating what they say. There's pauses in there. They're not as articulate. Um, there are people who are um, uh, uh, very sensitive and in the now and very responsive to people or they're in their own world, you know. Uh, there's such a range. You, know, you can see, uh, I always use that example of uh, Robert Duvall played Boo Radley in To Kill a Mockingbird. And he doesn't have one line. He doesn't have one line. And he plays this very tender, very damaged guy. I mean, so damaged, you know what I mean? But he becomes the hero of the film or one of the heroes of the film. And I think Duvall is on screen minimally, but he just, he just, he rips your heart out, you know, because he's so true to that character, that weak, damaged, kind of just terrified, like a, like a, like a, like a, like an animal, like a terrified animal, you know? Um, <clears throat> And I think it's just one of the most beautiful performances ever in the movie is Duval and To Kill a Mockingbird. But but all those things like Pacino, uh, you, when you watch The Godfather Part Two and see how much Pacino lays back, don't act, don't act, don't push, don't push, just say the words. Here's my offer to you, Senator. Nothing. <laughs> Here's my offer to you, Senator. Don't don't put, don't stand up and scream. You know, think about how other actors might have played those scenes and Pacino just stayed very dry, very dry. Just said the words, the words had the power. What made it even more chilling was the less emotional he was. He goes the other way. He's not yelling, he's not screaming. And uh, um, you have to ask yourself about that, about the sound of the character, the voice of the character, the movements of the character. Is the character somebody that sits in a chair and is a, is, is a very kind of sedentary person? Is he a guy that's on the balls of his feet, who's, you know, uh, um, you know very animated? There's, there's a whole list of things you can do. But if it's good writing, the writing will tell you what to do. The writing tells you what to do. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I have a question here from a Jonathan Clauser. Jonathan, we've enabled you to start your microphone. What is your question for Alec? Uh, hey, okay. Um, so my question is, do you believe that as an actor, you should try and stretch yourself as much as possible to be versatile? Or if you find something you're great at, okay, double up on that because I'm already great at it and I can become as best I can. Or do I want to be able to do everything? I think that's very personal. You know, you should you should obviously do what you think is right. I mean, there are people I know who they wanted to try different things. And I certainly uh, have had periods in my life where I wanted to try different things. And uh, uh, I did uh, 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 Macbeth at the Public Theater in 1998. I hadn't done a Shakespeare play in New York. And <clears throat> and I look back on that, and I think, uh, I think to myself, I got half of it right. You know, <laughs> the other half I didn't get very, I didn't get right. There's some scenes I didn't quite get it the way it should have, way, what I imagined in my head. There's, there's plays I've done. Uh, I always find this work is more easy to gauge in the, uh, um, in the theater business because, you know, you, you, I've done new plays, but I've done a lot of revivals and you sit there and say, well, the material works. We know the material works. Um, if you do Streetcar, or I did uh, 20th Century or other plays, or All My Sons, Equus, things I've done like that where the play is worthy. The question is, can we come up to the right level? Uh, I have tried, you know, when they asked me to do Trump, I thought, oh God, I, do, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And, uh, uh, but I gave it a, a, a you know, I gave it a, a, a whirl and, um, but I think that there are people who they found something, they find something that works for them. That tends to be more the universe of movie stars, you know, like big movie stars who they're being paid to do the same thing over and over again. There's a kind of a, there's a, kind of a tone they have in their acting and they're asked to 
replicate that again and again. I, I think you should try everything. Sound advice. I have a, a question here from Sarah um, Botteler. Sarah, we've gone ahead and enabled your microphone. What is your question for Alec? Hi, thank you for answering my question. My question is, what do you know now that you wish you knew at the beginning of your career? <sighs> well, <clears throat> there's a few things, actually. There's a couple things I wish I knew, but one is, uh, one is to, uh, uh, while you're younger, uh, you all, I'm assuming all of you were very young in this program, you know, while you're younger, um, uh, don't worry so much about making it, you know, when you're 22, 23. I mean, I did TV uh, until 1989, uh, and I, I'd done films in 86, 87, so forth. I did films for TV for about six years. Then I started making films in 86. And I think it's great for people to take a year and join a rep company. I think it's great for people to, because it's one thing to be in a classroom. Classrooms are important, but eventually you move beyond the classroom. You don't want to become a classroom actor. And there is such a thing, I think, as a classroom actor. You want to study and give that everything you can. And, and, and the point is make your mistakes outside of the white hot spotlight of the business. You know, grow out of that spotlight. It's, it's very difficult to grow. Once you find something that works in the business, people want you to stick with that and your growth may end. And I think that um, you should do like a, you know, a season of rep, uh, uh, you know, go to Louisville, La Jolla, Seattle, I mean, obviously this is a post COVID notion, but um, uh, uh, the Guthrie, find a place, Williamstown, go somewhere where it's just about you and a bunch of people immersing yourself in this work and uh, not thinking about, because it's sad for me sometimes, although it's understandable, that I talk to a bunch of young people sometimes and they say, how do I get an agent and how do I get, how do I make it? in the business. And I think there's a part of me that thinks, you know, that is written, you know, you're, you're, you're going to make it or you're not. I, 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 I know that you have to be, it helps to be talented, but you don't have to be. But I think it's great when you're really young, 22, 23, 24, before you're 25 years old, just really, really do as many shows as you can. Do as many plays as you can. Play roles, you know, do as many roles. And, and I know that there's a limitation on the roles for young people that are worthwhile. Good roles are tough in every age group, except, you know, when you're usually in your thirties and forties, but <clears throat> do as much theater, rep theater and, 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 and kind of off the beaten path theater work as you can. Tova, do we have time for one more? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. We have a question here from Felix Rivera. Felix, we've enabled you to start your microphone. What is your question for Alec? Yes. Uh, my, good, thank you for answering my question, Mr. Bowman. Uh, my question is, when it comes to auditioning, uh, what are some of the best practices that you use uh, to, get, to prepare for it? Well, without getting too uh, uh, over the top about it, remember that they asked you there, I used to go into auditions with a very people-pleasing attitude. You know, I remember when I was very young, when I was your age, when I was like out of college or in, in that college in my early 20s, I walked in with a very, very, hi, hi, oh, thank you so much, thank you, thank you. You know, like really very kind of uh, um, giving all my power away, you know, which is, which is again, in one sense, you don't have any power, but in the other sense, you do, which is that they want what you have. You, 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 you didn't call them up and ask them to set up an audition on your behalf. They invited you to come to an audition. They asked you to come and do this thing for them. And they, they, they need you. They need you. The idea that you, that, 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 that you need them more than they need you is something that the minute you suspend that, everything gets real clear and clean. You're in a room and you're like, what do you want me to do? Want me to read this? Great. If you act like you're, if you're flashing this insecurity of like, you know, thank you, oh God, thank you so much. 
and you're and you're really kind of uh, 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 abasing yourself in that process. I, I don't think it's going to work. I think what you want to do is you want to walk in, and you're a professional. You know, they 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 are looking for someone to play a part, and you give it everything you've got in the audition. And then, you know, and just say thank you and walk out. You know, this, but the idea of uh, that they're doing you some favor. Once you walk into the room and realize nobody's doing anybody any favors, it's business. And you're a part of that business. Then everything's going to change for you. Everything. Amazing. I think you're a born teacher. I think <laughs> what you said... Honestly, I think what every answer of yours was so profound in terms of that it really shone a light of whatever the question was. So I, I wish we had a little more time because this is actually amazing. Before we go, I wanted to tell you a couple of uh, connections that you maybe have to the school that you didn't know. First of all, the founder of the school, Jerry Sherlock, basically optioned the book of The Hunt of Red October, sold it to Paramount, and has an executive producer credit on that movie, on your big movie. The second thing that a mutual friend, Lyle Kessler, we brought him to the school to do some scene breaks. Yeah. So that was wonderful. And the third, of course, is that your daughter took some screen um, writing classes and we love her. And if she ever wants to come back and do some online classes right now from the convenience of their home, we're going to embrace her. So um, I wanted to thank you for taking time away from your busy schedule, your growing family, and come and help those people. And I think just for the few questions, you help so much. I really, it was exceptional answers. So think about teaching because you are born one. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for well, coming. Thank you all very much for your time. I hope this was, you, was, was worthwhile. And thank you so much, Tova. Thank you. It was amazing. Really, really. Everybody stay safe. Stay safe, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.